Let me t- let me tell you what our list is tonight. You ready? It's another taste of cinema list. Oh well, I like them. It is. Uh, like them. It is the the twenty best movie soundtracks of the nineteen seventies. Oh wow! Twenty best movie soundtracks of the nineteen seventies. Are you okay. like my Ed McMahon? Like whatever, yes. whatever Johnny Carson does, the uh, the guy that reads the cards or whatever. Yeah, that's what I'm what's alluding what's, to. What's his name? <laughs> uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, oh God, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Carmack. Carmack. Carmack, Carmack, yeah. yeah. Carmack yes. the Magnificent or something. Or <laughs> yes. Yes, that's what I'm. That, that's what I'm trying to achieve. Oh, well, Thank there you. you've done it. You you have done it. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I look forward to seeing you on uh, you uh, on Star Search later. The, num- the number uh, the number twenty on this list is Summer of Forty Two from Michel Legrand. Oh, that's oh. That, that's quite wonderful. Yeah, no question about it. Wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no complaints with that one, no. And Stanley Kubrick used a clip from Summer of Forty Two in what movie? Uh, in The Shining. There you go. Yeah, I mean, we don't have much choices to work with. I mean, for that movie, I mean, we have to go. Uh, Killer's Kiss. Uh, you're right, you're right. Yeah. Uh, number 19 on this list. Best movie soundtracks of the 1970s. Mary, Queen of Scots from John Barry. Wow. And that's a that's an incredibly uh, obscure one. Uh, yeah. I uh, I love everything John Barry does. So I, 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 that yeah. doesn't it doesn't ring a bell uh, for me. I, but, I don't know if there's uh, bells on it, but uh, <laughs> you know John Barry. I've is, seen the uh, film. John Barry is one of those composers that uh, I mean there there were quite a few of them back in the day where they could score quite a bit. Uh, of different films, and yet their sound was so distinctive, and that's what yeah. interests me about film composing. It's probably something that I'm going to ask Elliot Goldenthal. Is the um, because when you're a film composer, you want to do as many different kinds of projects as possible, and you're working with so many different directors that pull different things out of you. So, what is the conundrum between having a being a chameleon and having a, a distinctive musical voice, like where does how does that work? Where does that fall? And I I don't think that's something that can actually be defined, really. Mm-hmm. Right. And John Barry was just I mean, outside I mean he had a lot of great scores. One of my favorites is The Lion of Winter. Mm-hmm. That's John, and that's a beautiful score. I love that. Score. Oh, I, I, even, I even love I love uh, I even love High Road to China. Like I, oh yeah, I, to I, I think that's a I think that's a brilliant score. I mean, I, I think that's a wonderful score. Uh, like one of his, yeah, one of his greats. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, he, you know, again, he, he just never did anything bad. I mean, he's the the last uh, the last major uh, soundtrack that I got was a collection of John Barry that was uh, recorded mm-hmm. by, I think, a Polish. Uh, 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 a Polish orchestra, right. and uh, uh, they they went through the major themes of almost every movie, uh, and uh, it, it's fantastic. And it's so true that I can't name the number of times where a movie is started and just the first notes of a score come on. Yeah. So this mu- is this a John Barry score? It must yeah. be because it's just. I will say you know they it. sound the uh, same, but they're distinctive. You know, they're like, right. oh wow. Well, just uh, you know, it's the same thing with Morricone. It's the same thing mm-hmm. to some extent with Jerry Goldsmith, like mm-hmm. uh, who did lots of different movies. I mean, you want to talk about a guy that was diverse? Uh, yeah. So they they had it back then. Now it's yeah. you can't tell one from another because it's all just uh, ambient sound effects. But, uh, right yeah. now, there is some truth to that. I mean, that's what I think made the Hateful Eight so that score so incredible was wow. You know, it. it, it sounded oh, it brought back moment. tune to the <laughs> yeah yeah. To, hum, to a, hum a theme that uh, hum a theme that Steve Jablonski has written. Yeah, <laughs> right. It's true. It's lots of lots yeah. You got you got me there, man. You got me there. You can't hum movie themes anymore. It's really no. it's really irritating to me. Yeah. Um Okay, so moving on. Number 18. 
Midnight Express from Giorgio Maroder. Giorgio yes. Maroder. Oh wow! Good yeah, good absolutely. So Oscar Oscar winner that for in seventy eight, uh, and pretty much changed. Uh, I think changed movie scoring in a lot of ways. I mean, after that, you started seeing yeah. more electronic stuff. Uh, um, uh, you know, more. Uh, uh, Stuff like you know, Tangerine Dream and so forth. And mm-hmm. so and that, you got that the was people like who, who who we're talking to on Monday, Jan Hammer, uh-huh. uh, and then and then who we've already talked to, Harold Faltermeyer. I mean, you get the mm-hmm. yeah the, synth, the synth, synth synthesizer becoming the main driver of scores in the eighties. Yeah, right, absolutely, and all music really. But uh, number seventeen on this list, the harder they come. Wow. That's a, I mean, that's a, uh, you know, I, I prefer, I, that's a great score, but it's a song score, you know, it's not, right, a, right. it's not an underscore. Uh, but sa- yeah, I mean, that's a great, sa- sound, that's a fantastic soundtrack. soundtrack. Yeah. yeah, this general movie soundtrack. Yeah, uh, okay. Number 16 is uh, Suspiria by Goblin. Suspiria by Goblin. Oh, okay. yeah, that's, yeah. That, that's terrific, too. I wouldn't put it in the top 20, but... Number fifteen, Rocky by Bill Conti. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. The, it has to be on there. I mean, somewhere on that list. I mean, I mean, but it, that wasn't even the best score of that year. Just think about it. that year had uh, you had well, Taxi Driver. <laughs> you know, yeah. the, mm-hmm. you know. So, uh, I, you know. It's it's a great score, but that was a great year for scores. I mean, that also you know seventy six had the Omen and, and oh one uh, of the best oh god uh, that's one of the best and uh, and another Bernard Herman obsession so oh and that's a great right. score too yeah yeah so that was a Bernard Herman up. completed the Taxi Driver score um, hours before he died right. Number 14, this is interesting because in my interview with William Friedkin, the first time I talked to him, I asked him about uh, Morricone. And he said, uh, because he worked with him on the movie Rampage, which is not a pleasant score to listen to, but it's entirely effective for the movie. But it's not something mm-hmm. you like unwind and pop on <laughs> Morricone's Rampage with a glass of wine. <laughs> it's not that kind of score. Uh, but he said that he was expecting Morricone to do a score like this one at number 14, and instead he got something completely different because Morricone doesn't uh, read English uh, or, or, or uh, he didn't speak it back then very well. Uh, Oliver Stone said the same thing. So they really couldn't communicate. So near Morricone usually comes back to a director with something completely different from what they had in mind, uh, which is the conundrum with Morricone. said you can either go with it even though it's and, and just become accustomed to it or mm-hmm. resist it, at which point you need to get another composer probably. Uh, well, what was number the movie? fourteen, number fourteen, investigation of a citizen above suspicion. Oh, mm. okay. That that doesn't ring a bell either. So, but this is a good it, list, though. I mean, this it. is a good, interesting list. Mm-hmm. So, so anyone that hasn't heard these scores, you can look them up. They're there on YouTube, Spotify, whatever. But if you go to the Anir Morricone Spotify page, uh, you will be scrolling for two, three months. I swear to God, yes. that has to be the <laughs> longest page. Um, and most of it are collections. Like he's had so many, like, Best of Morricone and the Spaghetti Western collection and the Romance yeah. collection. I mean, it's like endless. Uh-huh. Um, number 13 is what most people would think would be at number one. Which is Saturday Night Fever, the Bee Gees and David Shire. Uh, iconic. Everybody yeah. had it. You can go go to any record store and they'll uh you know, like used record store and there'll be like ten copies there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh but uh it's it's great, you know. I like David Shire. Interviewing David yeah. Shire was like a big deal for me too because I loved his scores and I so wish yeah. his score for um, the Dustin Hoffman movie the uh, Straight where he's an ex-con yeah oh, God, I wish that yeah, score was available oh such a great score 
Yeah, like talk about a score that you end up humming afterwards, even yeah. though that's not a movie that leaves you humming. But uh, <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's not a happy movie, but uh, but it does have a score that just sticks into your head. It's just like what? But like uh, he was he was again another fantastic guy who did uh, you know Norma Ray when he won an Oscar mm-hmm. for the song for Norma Ray, but he also did the underscore uh, the conversation. And uh brilliant and the conversation. Yeah. And he was he, and when he was with Coppola my... yeah, I know Take Impel on one, two, three, but when he was with Coppola, he he was like, Oh great, I'm working with the like the Godfather guy, so I'm gonna be able to do this big orchestral thing and Coppola was like, No, I just want a piano. I just want like a jazzy piano, something <laughs> something solitary. And that theme is so Oh my god, I listen to that theme at least once a month. I love that theme. Yes, it's haunting. Number 12 on this list is another iconic score. It's John Williams' Jaws. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean... You know, that's that's the kind of score that I would think might be in the top ten. <laughs> yeah, Maybe yeah. the top five, really. I mean, <laughs> I mean, Jaws is... I mean, that's as iconic... I mean that, and I'm sure another one on this list that he's writing Star Wars is as iconic as you can get for the '70s. And I mean, for yeah. scores, I mean, blockbuster scores. I mean, and again, and they it, were the kind of scores that changed changed scoring. I mean, to, yeah, you know, yeah. So, so influential, uh, and, and also the changed Anglo- the movie, a hundred percent. You know, yeah. And it's it's and also you know like one of the scores that. Because we know it in tangent with the movie now, it's uh, it's irreplaceable from our thoughts of the movie. I mean, you say Jaws and people think duh duh, you know, it's just it's part of that char- the character of that movie, right. how it lives on. Number eleven, Lalo Schifrin, who I believe is still with us, like he's still he's yes. still kicking. Uh, his score for Dirty Harry. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's a great score. I think that's his, I, I think that and uh and um Cool Hand Luke are his two mm-hmm. greatest scores. Uh uh yeah, absolutely. And it still blows my mind that uh he he uh you know, that that Dirty Harry score was not nominated for the Oscar. It's so uh it's so memorable and so effective, and it really is. Uh, it really ratchets up the tension quite a bit. Number ten, Trouble Man from Marvin Gaye. That's fun. I mean, you know, yeah. that's that's a. Uh, I've never heard the entire score. I actually have never seen that movie, but uh, I know the the main theme, the main song, and. Uh, um, did Marvin Gaye, Marvin Gaye wrote that whole score, huh? Yeah, uh, yeah. Like an underscore to it, I wonder. Uh, yeah, I mean, I prefer Shaft, uh, right. you know, Isaac Hayes. Mm-hmm. But, Superfly. Uh, oh, God, I listen to Superfly all the time, too. Superfly, mm-hmm. uh, too. Oh, uh, God, those I love two that scores. Yeah. Um, number nine. Also, Pusher Man. That's pretty good. I'm your mama. I'm your daddy. I'm that nigga. Yeah, your daddy. that's good. The whole thing, the uh, whole, the whole <laughs> score though, the, all the underscore stuff is really good too. I mean, like on both of those movies, not just yeah. the songs, but the yeah. Number nine, Chinatown from Jerry Goldsmith. Mm-hmm. That would be in the top five for me. Right, I would say another amazing accomplishment for not the least of. Of which is the fact that it was written so quickly because they dis- he had to discard the previous score he had on Chinatown because nobody liked it, and Jerry Goldsmith had like I don't know like a week or something to compose what mm-hmm. he ended up with, I mean, which is incredible. Uh-huh. Number eight, number eight best movie soundtrack of all time according to A Taste of Cinema is The Clockwork Orange. Uh, not of all time of the seventies. Yeah, the seventies. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it, it's great. Uh, it's a great collection of of stuff, and I mean, it's yeah. effectively used in the movie. But it, I, you know, I mean, I guess it's a you know, it's a it's a found. I mean, it's a source music score. So, uh, yeah, it's good. 
the, the, I mean, the selections of music, I think, are, are very, you know, as with any No, I mean, it was film. it was all done for the movie. I mean, those reworked, uh, synthi- right. synthesized oh, the synthesized classical pieces. Oh, the synthesized. Yeah, but there's, yeah, a yeah. Lot of, there's a lot of needle drops on there, you know, like, I Want to Marry a Lighthouse Keeper. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I love that song. That's one of my And all the, things. all the, you know, it, the, one of those, uh, one of those Walter Carlos or Wendy Carlos things is taken from his album, so that's a sort of a needle drop, and and then there's the orchestral versions of all the Beethoven and so yeah. forth in it. So I mean, those I like are all the synth stuff, but I do think "I Married a Lighthouse Keeper" is one of the one of my favorite tracks on that whole soundtrack. To be <laughs> yeah, that's fun. Number seven on this list is "Superfly." Yeah. Okay. That's good. Number uh, number six Absolutely. on this list is uh, Taxi Driver from Bernard Herrmann. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Number five is the Mean Street soundtrack. Cool. Well, now we're just getting... I mean, that's... that's uh, first of all, they never released a soundtrack from Mean Streets. So there is... there. is... I've never seen a... I've never seen a record for Mean Streets, you know. Uh, so I don't know that that really exists. So that's my problem with that. <laughs> it well, might it probably I, maybe it does. You know, it probably set the groundwork for a lot of what we see in those kinds of movies now. I mean, because he had the Stones. Uh, you know, Jumpin' Jack Flash was Johnny Boy's theme. He had, uh, and that opening with "Be My Baby." Yeah. Uh, was uh, and that great know, just, that great scene where where uh, Harvey Keitel is drunk and and wandering through the bar to uh, Rubber Biscuit by uh, the Chips. Mm-hmm. The old, yeah, that's great. Mm-hmm. Number four is uh, Shaft. Okay, um, that's a great one. Number, I love that sound. Number th- number three is another one that we've already talked about. The conversation. Mm-hmm. Number two. Is American Graffiti the groundbreaker? The real, the, I mean, as far I, I, that would be the one uh, uh, source music score uh, that uh, I would I would include in this. Number one, because I mean, it, it's like it just you know that collection of songs is just so perfect. Um, that it's really hard to rival. Right. Mm-hmm. Any idea what number one is? Star yeah, Wars. Star Wars or The Godfather. It's an amazing that Star Wars isn't on here. I that is amazing. Uh, it, or Close Encounters. Is, yeah. Yeah. That's it, a, number one is The Godfather. Yep. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's so many of them. I mean, of course, on the on my website uh you know i've been going through the i just got finished doing the 70s and and now i'm up to 82 uh and uh what uh, god even an article like this there's all these nasty comments <laughs> posted on it oh yeah at the end, oh, like, how could you oh, leave yeah. this shit off or whatever? Yeah. Think, yeah, and so this one guy's like, what about Days of Heaven and Assault on Precinct 13? And right below it, somebody writes, what about Fuck You? <laughs> <laughs> there you go, dude. There you go. That's the internet. There you go, man. Well, yep. <sighs> Comment sections are just like the, the seething uh, underbelly of anger. I mean, like... Hey. The, the Trump campaign is the comment section of all of Brought politics. to life Ugh. in human form. It's in human yes. alive in human form. That's exactly Dean. That's exactly what it. It is. It is the Drudge Report link to the comment sections of any article that you. If you go to anything linked from Drudge Report, I don't care what kind of website, especially the movie, the entertainment website. It's the Hollywood. Yeah, Reporter. yeah. They link to. Oh my they link God. to. If you go to Variety. If you go to Variety, if people yeah, don't go, oh, I, if oh listeners don't do this, you should check this out, listeners. But go to Variety or to uh, or to Hollywood Reporter or the rap. and go check out the rap. or yeah, and check out the comments sections, and you'll be like, 
What the hell? It's been like invaded by a bunch of right wingers who hate Hollywood. What are they oh, doing that, here? And then you trace it back, and it all goes to Drudge. That's that's where always, it comes from. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, and it <laughs> read is read some it more is of the best. comics, David. Just read some more of the comics. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I just love it how people say, "No, no, no, you're you're wrong." Like, no, not not you know, not really. I mean, because they're they're talking from their point of view. If, yeah, they were representing, if they were representing your point of view when they made these picks, then they'd be wrong. And you can't say that this list is uneducated. I mean, because because it's all over the map. So it's not like yeah. the guy was a slacker. Uh, Although he does, he, he does tend to pick, you know, the coolest movies of the 70s to have on the list. I mean, uh, you know, Mary Queen of Scots notwithstanding, you know, they're all like, ooh, taxi driver, godfather, poopadoo, plapata. You know, these are the cool movies. Plapata? Where the hell is that? <laughs> you know, the, uh, they are. They're like, hey. So somebody <laughs> recommended uh, Patton, Diamonds Are Forever, Star Wars. A little romance. There's your George what, Delarue. What does it say beneath that one? What does it say? Beneath yeah, that? a little romance. No, there's 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 nothing snippy under this one. Okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, uh, uh, there's you know things like you know uh, a lucky man or uh, John Williams' incredible score for uh, images, the uh, Robert Altman right. movie. That's just mm-hmm. that's that's nuts. Uh, you know, Tommy. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would pick yeah. up the, Nashville. You talk about the the big, you know, to, uh, Greece was the big. Yeah, yeah. Night Fever. Yeah, where, I mean, yeah, where is Greece on there? Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah, Greece definitely is, as a seller. I mean, uh, definitely that should be on there. I mean, you know, things like you know Bugsy Malone or, uh, uh, yeah, I you know love uh, you know things like. Phantom of the Paradise, or mm-hmm. uh, yeah, that's another one. Yeah, all, all that jazz. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the the movies could be more diverse, I think, but uh, the scores are good. So, I mean, it's not a dumb list. Very good, very good. I'm glad we didn't indulge in a dumb list this evening. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. It was, it was a very, it was a very good, very diverse list, actually. So, next next week we'll try to rectify it with a dumb list. Those are always fun. <laughs>